enough fuel choice that even rivals can agree on? Now that's worth the hype. Cheaper, cleaner, and homegrown. Pump it up with Unleaded 88. Scott Doctorman. Chad Leistico. Together on one pod, talking odds in all things Big Ten. Powered by Game Day Men's Health. With locations in Ankeny, West Des Moines, and North Liberty. From the Channel Seed Studios. This, this is Legends and Listeners. Exclusively on Iowa Everywhere. Hey, Hawkeye fans, Big Ten fans, and Iowans everywhere. Welcome to episode number 65 of Legends and Listeners. I'm Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register. He is Scott Docterman of The Athletic, and we are coming to you live from the Harvesting Channel Seed Studios at Iowa Ever. It is harvest season. It's daylight savings this weekend, Scott. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like that unleaded uh, 88 ad at the beginning. Uh, that is that is my fuel of choice as well. I, I I get, people ask me about it. Like, can I put that in my car? I, well, I got, it's 15 cents per gallon cheaper and it's, it runs just as good. I get just as good a mileage. I feel like, so do you ever, do you ever reach for the 88 or are you 87 guy? <laughs> are you premium? Do you like have some fancy? Oh, no. I don't, kidding. I don't, I don't have enough <laughs> gold in my pocket for a premium. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I go for the 88 when I can see it usually at Casey's and, and I, mm-hmm. I do like to fill up with it because yeah, again, 15 cents is, 15 cents. So I'll, I'll take it, you know, uh, off whatever I'm, whether I'm filling up my edge or my wife's uh, <laughs> Nissan Sentra. But, um, you know, as far as daylight savings goes, I hate it. I absolutely cannot stand it. And it's because I hate looking outside at five o'clock and it's dark, mm-hmm. you know, you can't do anything, you know? And so, you know, old man yelling at the moon, but that's, that's me or the sky or the clouds or whatever <laughs> clouds, I think is <laughs> the clouds. Okay. I'm trying not to be cliche here, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yelling always, at the moon. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well howling at the moon. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I guess if nothing else, I, I always thought, man, why can't we do it like right after Thanksgiving, you know, cause sometimes it's still nice in November and I want to grill out, but anyway, <laughs> old man uh, grilling. Right now. Uh, I, forgive me if I've told this daylight savings story before, but it is, <laughs> it makes me laugh every time. So a uh, couple, several years ago, uh, Mark Emmert, uh, formerly of the register and I covered an Iowa Purdue football game, Scott. Mm-hmm. And we stayed in Danville, Illinois, which as you know, Mm-hmm. Uh, is on the absolute border uh, mm-hmm. of Indiana and of the time switch. Well, it happened, whatever the game was, it was, it was the weekend of, of daylight savings time. And so we stayed in Dan. So not only did it switch the clocks, but we're in Danville where you can't even tell mm-hmm. like if your phone switched or not. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the hotel clock, you obviously can't trust that. It was like mm-hmm. two hours off. So I had no idea what to expect. And so, uh, and Mark and I talked about meeting in the, you know, meeting in the lobby at a certain time or whatever. And anyway, we both showed up at the correct time and we both realized the only way we knew the time is we Googled <laughs> what time is it where I am right now? <laughs> we both did the same thing because you didn't know if your, your uh, phone switched or it, it was crazy. Um, said no idea. But. Yeah, I had one of the, I had actually two of those. I'll make them quick, you know, so we can get on to what people really want to listen to. But well, they're both tied into Iowa football, I guess. One was in the 2012 money pit of a season. Um, we were at Indiana and it was, uh, I was with the Gazette at that time with Mark Morehouse, uh, Brian Ray and Jim Slosarek, our photographers. And, and uh, so the, there was a lightning strike. So the game got delayed about an hour. And so it was supposed to start at like three 30 central, or uh, 3.30 Eastern and ended up 4.30 Eastern. We got out of Bloomington at like 10 o'clock and it was on uh, the Saturday before the time change. And by the time we got to Danville, it was like right at one in the morning or so. And so we had the vortex of the East Central time change plus the overall turn back the clocks. It wasn't until I got to about Peoria before we figured out what time it was because we just didn't you know what it was but that was pretty wild and then the other one was at penn state in 16 
And um, I had the first oh, flight okay. out. It was a late game yep. or, you know, a Saturday night game. First flight out of Happy Valley. And uh, it was like 545. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go to the ho- go to the airport. Little did I know it was turned back the clock day. <laughs> and so I was there an extra hour, you know, when I hadn't gotten to bed yet. So that was, <laughs> it was me and, um, Bobby Lejess who worked with me mm-hmm. at the land of 10 and then, and then Morehouse and Halas were doing the same thing. So it was just, I'm like, man, wow. staying, it's like six 45 now. So, well, and plus that game was <laughs> one of the worst to ever cover, to be honest. It yeah. Was, it was ugly. So ugly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 599 yards. 599 yards. Well, anyway, Scott, uh, a lot going on. Uh, as Aiden said in our uh, pre show here, uh, you know, another slow news week in Iowa City. Uh, the Iowa football team continues its on again, off again trend with an uplifting 40 to 14 stampede of overmatched Northwestern a week after the discouraging. 32 to 20 loss at Michigan State, but the same old Hawkeyes are finally getting a new look for the first time since CJ Bethard in 15 and 16. The Hawkeyes truly starting a mobile quarterback in Brendan Sullivan this week. Scott, there's an undeniable feeling of hope surrounding the Iowa quarterback position heading into Saturday's matchup with Wisconsin, but there's also some worry based on the depth right now uh, with the backup position. Uh, so to so to quote Shawshank Redemption here, Scott, is hope a good thing uh, at the quarterback position for Hawkeye fans, Scott? I love you quoting Shawshank, man. When we get to that 45 minutes or so before the end of it, I'm all mm. I'm like, OK, <laughs> I'm, I'm on it now. You're I locked in. Yep. Yeah, it's you know, it's <laughs> like Eric Cartman singing, you know, come sail away with me on, <laughs> on South Park. But uh, <laughs> that's me watching Shawshank. Yeah. But I, I would say this, that, yes, hope is a good thing here. And, it you know, and it's unfortunate, first of all, that Caden McNamara had a concussion. He got rocked. It was pretty obvious. And and he was on the sidelines without his helmet, which is that, OK, we're checking for your head injury and we're pulling your helmet. Um, but, you know, looking at Brendan Sullivan, much more mobile quarterback, you know, and he proved it very quickly, you know, out of the gates there for on Saturday. And, and I think when you look at what Tim Lester's offense is kind of the RPO and, and zone read type of thing, that's his forte because he can, he can run, but he's also really quick. And so he can pull the ball down and then throw it. And he was really accurate last year over the middle for Northwestern. I think this is, um, you know, it's, it's a good move because, and in part, it's not, you know, I think in practice, of course, it looks like Cade was probably a little bit more accomplished as a passer, but it's not really translating to the games. You know, there's just been a lot of mistakes there. It's not like you're, you're trading much in the way of passing or, and, and, you know, to, to get what you're going to get here. So, and, and plus, you know, we can talk about this too, but you know, next year as well. So right. I'll cut myself off there and kind of kick it back over to you on this. <laughs> Well, I think that's the that's the conclusion. I think that even before seeing Brennan Sullivan, it was like, you know, the pass part of Iowa's offense can't really drop off that much. Like I, I feel like you're I feel like you're gonna stay steady at with the pass production at least with, with Brennan Sullivan. I don't you know, not maybe it will be an upgrade, but you're obviously gaining the upgrade in in the mobility in I mean, we saw it, right? We saw the uh, the extra attention that he requires uh, from a defense. I mean, that's why he was good in the red zone, goal to go, because you win the numbers game when the quarterback can run. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's as simple as that, and it it paid off for Caleb Johnson in the game on Saturday. Uh, it paid off with with Brendan Sullivan. Just uh, he's faster than I thought, Scott. I, I wonder. I have to wonder if some of the speed work over the summer at Iowa maybe was really beneficial for for a good athlete like him. And he's a bigger guy, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I think we can both qualify as Andy Dufresne here. We are going to lean into hope. (laughs) We don't need to be red uh, who who (laughs) puts the kibosh on hope, uh, warns against hope. Uh, That said, uh, let's what do you think the expectations realistic expectations for Sullivan are because, um, you know, I think he's still a pretty average overall quarterback, Scott. It's not like he's 
you know, some prodigy waiting in the wings here. Um, there's a reason he wasn't playing, but so what do you think realistic expectations are for Brandon Sullivan? I think it's, uh, you know, maybe this is a little bit nebulous, but I would say make the makeables in the passing game. If you have open receivers, make it, you know, if you don't, then, um, you know, if you don't have it, eat it or run it or whatever. And so I'm not really expecting, for instance, him to be, you know, to go out there and, and complete 75%. And throw three touchdowns and no interceptions and and look like, you know, Bethard, for instance. You know, I I don't think he's Bethard. I think more so he's um, you know just a really uh, you know a really mobile quarterback who's capable of of making accurate passes. I don't know about his long you know his downfield passing. That's not anything to worry about because they weren't, haven't been very good at it anyway. So uh, for me, keep it narrow. Throw, make the makeables in the passing game, and rely on your feet. You know, if it's third and, third and five, we saw them take off. That's good. You know, that's something that the defense can't prepare for. Or if they're prepared for it, then they then they leave somebody else open. So I, I really like what he brings from that perspective. And and then big picture, if if he's good enough in this game and probably UCLA is my guess, I don't know. Tell me what you think on that. But I, I kind of think he gets about two games before. And then after they come back from UCLA, maybe it's, uh, you know, okay, he's not as good as we thought and some things happened and go back to Cade, but it gives you an opportunity to look ahead too, because if he's good, well, then maybe that changes any kind of thought process regarding next, next season, which is also important. Yeah, that's actually you know, it was on my list of topics here was mm-hmm. you know, what is it is this Brendan Sullivan's team the rest of the way? Is it uh you know, how long of a leash does he get here? Like uh obviously Cade McNamara, uh, for those that don't know, is out this week uh with the concussion. Uh Kirk Ferentz said hopefully uh they'll get him back for the UCLA game. You never know with these things. I mean he he could be cleared on Monday, he could be cleared on Sunday, he could be cleared you know, the week of Black Friday, we do, we don't we don't know that. Um, and right now, they it does not look like they're going to have Marco Linus uh, for the game either. So, uh, it's a tough situation with um, you know he's got to stay healthy. Um, Jackson Stratton is is your backup right now, and we don't know much about him. Uh, and then it's a, a high school quarterback that Kirk Ferentz humorously said, "I hope you never find out who it is." Nothing. <laughs> him, so. A Quinn Schulte, <laughs> or Jackson Rex Roth. <laughs> yeah, there. Okay. It was a high school quarterback. Um, I think I know who it is, but I, I don't. I don't want to say it for sure. But um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely somebody way, way, way off the radar. If it is, <laughs> so um, if I'm right. Um, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you kind of tell everybody about Marco? What's kind of going on there? Well, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, all I know is he's not going to be available this weekend. Um, I don't have uh, authority to, to say why yet at this point. Nothing on the record um, that I can report uh, specifically, but he's he's just not um, not going to be available this week so um it's nothing like legal or anything like that um Mm. so uh but he's he's not uh not able to play this week um i i I assume it's gonna be able to come out soon um i just don't want to be the one to say that so um say what it is so um anyway sullivan is it's his show i mean it's totally his show and there has to be um probably a little restraint in the game plan. I would think uh, that's why I asked Kirk Ferentz the other day is Marco line is available. He, he dodged it. Um, and is, you know, what do they do? Uh, you know, I, I think they're probably, probably going to limit the called run Scott, but uh, as, as Tyler and I talked about on Hawk central, I think you have to be yourself like that. You have to win this game. Like you, you can't go into this trying to play it too safe and just keep him healthy through it. Cause we need him for the UCLA game. You just, you got to win this game. So yeah. uh, if that means Sullivan carries the ball 16, 17 times, so be it. Yeah. You, you can't be overly risk averse um, with that position and in the way he plays, because that's not his game. 
he's kind of, you know, Bethard was that way too. You know, I mean, now I think he's a better athlete than CJ. I think he might be as good of an athlete as they've ever had at that position, frankly. Um, you know, maybe since Marvin McNutt before he moved to wide receiver, um, you know, Sullivan's really fast and he's, he's good with, you know, running the football and, and that's something you need to take advantage of. And you can't just say, well, no, now you can tell him to slide, you know, do, do things to, to avoid unnecessary contact, but, you know, but I don't think you really want to delay his game and, you know, keep him from being, um, who he is as a player and keep your team away from being what makes it special and, and unique. So, um, but you do have to be cognizant that if you pull, if he gets out and then you're down to walk on territory and that's not a good thing for Iowa. So I, I really think um, you just have to be careful, not overly risk averse. And I know sometimes with Kirk, he gets that way. And he talked a little bit about that, I think tonight or Wednesday night on his um, show. And that was, um, you know, he's, he's just, he's gotta be, he's gotta be. What did he say? I missed I missed the show. I was watching the, I didn't, game. yeah, I didn't watch much of it. I just kind of turned to it and then I turned away. <laughs> I don't it's hard. It's to tough. To, it's tough to listen to. It, it is. is. It's like, I, I gotta go to the world. It was like, I wonder what, I wonder what Ference thinks about that show, you know, 26 years in, you know, like it's got to I wonder if like he just hates it or if he like just kind of laughs through it or or if he enjoys it, you know. He kind of gets an hour of of mic time to sort of not say anything. It's based on what I I mean, we get the the live feed. I don't know if you guys do or you just listen to it over the radio, but we get I just the, listen on, I listen on the radio. KCRG yeah. 9.2 and Cedar Rapids broadcast it live. Right, and, right. And so that's actually easier to listen to than over the radio and and um I would say that he's there because he has to be there. <laughs> that that would be my first guess. And uh I would say that um it's a 90 minute filibuster. Yeah, you know, the first is. half hour is you know, they bring in a coach like tonight. It was the rowing coach. And um, so I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't listen to that. And then, you know, and then the rest of the way it's kind of Dolph filling there. I mean, that's kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I don't think he, no, it's, think, yeah, it's tough. And plus they've neutered it, Chad. Right. They used, they used to have calls. Yeah. You know, and now you've got a tweet and of course they can discard any tweet they don't want or Facebook mm-hmm. or whatever, instead of having, um, uh, the, the guy in uh, Des Moines, Tommy from Des Moines, yeah. you know, who yeah. could hardly talk, but he'd throw something out there that Kirk wasn't prepared for, or, or what's her name down in Kia cuck or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do get, uh, you know, those shows used to be good for a little surprise factor, like, uh, the good, the, Old timey is that what Morehouse called it? Old timey. Yeah, we, always have, we, have to, we always have to have a Morehouse reference on Legends <laughs> listeners. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so every once in a while, there's there's some news value there, like with the gambling thing last year. He did kind of sound off on that. So uh, if there's something going on, I'll usually try to tune in. And they do yeah. put it on podcast now. So if you ever want to, if you really want to catch it out there, like and don't want to listen for an hour and a half, like download the podcast. Like listen to it on one and a half or even two speed and just fast forward through all those commercials and all the talking and you'll get, you can finish it in about 10 minutes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> anyway, how do I, I don't know how we got on that, but anyway, right. back to the, back to the Tim Lester game plan. So what is the game plan? I think our, more RPOs, Scott would be my guess. Um, I have to think that they're implementing more of that. And I think, I, I think it's probably a pretty exciting week for Lester who can kind of shape a, a little bit different style of game plan, maybe more his speed. Uh, we've talked a lot about, you know, the NFL offense that he has. I mean, I honestly, I kind of picture him using Sullivan kind of like the Niners do with Brock Purdy. I mean, Purdy is a mobile. He's been running a lot lately, mm-hmm. um, but not like as as much design. But like, hey, go get some yards with your legs, and um, I don't know. What do you what do you expect? from from tim lester this week not not so much sullivan Hmm. yeah i I think there's going to be a lot more of that run pass option you know which i think is going to be new and unique to this i think it's going to be helpful especially when you know if you're trying to run a some sort of a zone play and you've got everybody keyed in on caleb johnson then he can pull it down and, and take off and have that option to do that or 
dare I say, um, run pass option, which is he can pull it down and then throw it to Luke Lachey. Is he still on the team? You know, <laughs> Luke Lachey over the middle, that type of thing. That would be great, you know, and and just trying to hit more of those more of those people. Um, you know, I, I think that's going to be part of the game plan. It's just going to be much more um, spontaneous, you know, like the, the options will be there for, for Sullivan to do things, but the calls will be, I, I mean, there, there's some calls that Tim makes. It's really cool. I really like watching it. It just hasn't been executed to the, into that level. And I don't want to sound like Kirk, you know, well, it's all about execution, but it's true <laughs> in that situation. But what about you? What do you think you're going to get out of, uh, um, Tim Lester this week. Well, he's been a slow starter. Every, mm-hmm. I mean, they they really have not done much in the first halves of ball games. Um, usually, end of second quarters when they start uh, figuring stuff out, and then obviously the third quarters continue to be good. So I'm kind of expecting something similar. Um, I don't expect a you know a gangbusters first drive because um, he he does use those first couple drives to feel it out, like see how the defense is going to play play you. Uh, I think the good news for Lester is you saw Wisconsin uh, have to face Bo Pribula in mm-hmm. the second half of that ball game. And that's a, he's a similar style as Sullivan. Wouldn't you say like mm-hmm. fast quarterback can throw, but certainly, you know, more of a runner than drew Aller. And so I think you at least got to see how Wisconsin, you know, defends that. And so hopefully that helps him a little bit. Um, I do, I do think they've got to honor the pass. I think they've got to. Um, and I looked at, at Brendan Sullivan's, uh, deep shot numbers on pro pro, pro football focus, uh, mm-hmm. in his career. And he has, he has connected on, um, a lot of deep shots. They also have resulted in four of his five career interceptions, mm-hmm. uh, but he has not attempted one yet at Iowa. So I, I do think it is in his bag. I think his arm strength has to be better than Cade's. Um, I don't remember being impressed with his arm strength at Kids Day. I don't know about you. Uh, it was more short passes that, that we saw, I would say, but but Cade's long balls are uh, leave a lot to be desired, especially when he's on the move. I mean, you think about the – which game was? Oh, it was the Ohio State game, the first drive, right? Mm-hmm. Remember that, yeah. that roll out to the right, and he, he had Caden Weech in open, and right, uh, Hunter threw him by ten yards, maybe. Yeah, and then uh, you know the wounded duck the other day, uh, which was the the shot he took, same play, um, but that wasn't it was actually wasn't affected by the hit. Uh, the hit came after he threw the ball, and then of course the. Um, um, you know, he, he did overthrow Seth Anderson a little bit on that one deep shot. So, uh, anyway, not to get back into Cade too much, but uh, I guess I just think I think we're going to see probably more passing maybe than you'd expect just because I think you have to. I think you have to make a Wisconsin play that, and um, I, I feel okay about that. I do. I, I, I don't – I mean, I, why, do you, why do you think he hadn't been playing, though? Like Brennan? Yeah. Mm-hmm. it's Kirk, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not just saying that there are a lot of positives about Kirk and all that, but you know, quarterback choice, he's very steadfast. And in rare, I mean, th- this year has been more dramatic. Probably most people might go back to like 2001 and talk about Brad Banks and Kyle McCann and that sort of thing. That's really where this is. This is about the last time that they've done something like this, where they've had scripted plays for a backup quarterback to come in. And and yet Kirk's just been really averse to that. He's just really been locked in on quarterback. We've seen it over the years. Um, you know, 2012, um, the only year that they've had a losing record since uh, 2000 in the regular season. And James Vandenberg took every single snap that year, every single one of them. Even when they were eliminated from the Bulls, you know, they didn't, um, you know, give Jake Rudock a snap in a game. And and I thought that's pretty, you know, and that's just kind of what you get. And same thing with Deacon Hill, watching him all these years, you know, last year, you're like, what does it take to get you in a game? You know, and finally, it was only a pick six and a fumble inside your five in the bowl game that kind of did that. So, um, you know, it, so to me, that's more of a Kirk thing than it is. But that said, I don't want people to get the impression that this guy is Bethard or this guy is Rudock or, or Stanzi or whatever. He's he's a great athlete and he's a decent passer. But you know, just keep your 
hopes and you know for you you're not going to go out and get a 300 yard game let's just put it that way yeah i, I don't know where my expectations are i mean i, th- I feel like um if i'm kind of thinking it through in my head i feel like um i mean i feel like he should win the rest of these games honestly like i, I know that that seems like pretty mm-hmm. high expectations but um I feel better about Iowa's chance. I feel better about Iowa's chances the next four weeks than than I did with Cade. Um, that's just the way, you know. That's, that's how much importance I put on the the mobile quarterback aspect, especially when you got teams stack in the box against Caleb Johnson, which we saw with Michigan State. Right? Yeah. I mean, that was that was the whole problem mm-hmm. <laughs> that they referenced. I mean, Caleb Johnson said after the game. I mean, they just completely stacked the box and dared us to throw, and you know, Iowa did make some yards in the second half throwing, but, um, you know, you, you got to make them pay for stacking the box. And Brendan, Brendan Sullivan, I think, can make them pay. So I, I think my expectations are pretty high. I would be really disappointed if he um, – I mean, not really disappointed. I shouldn't say that. But I would be – I would be surprised if he really lets – ha- has underwhelming performances the next two weeks. I don't think they're going to be great, but I think they're going to be – yeah, that's what we thought he was going to do, you know, like 140 yards passing and maybe 35, 40 rushing and, you know, 65, 70% complete, maybe 14 to 20 through, you know, I don't know, something like that. Mm. And Caleb runs the ball well because you're lighting in the box. I mean, that, that's that's kind of what I expect. I don't, I agree. I don't expect world beating performances here. Yeah, it, it comes down to make, you know, the making the makeables. And Cade really didn't do that this year. Didn't do it consistently. Let's put it that way. You know that for in that game against uh, Michigan State in the first half, he was three and nine. He's missing wide open receivers, and it's just that's what you, you make. You hit a couple of those. They've got to defend you differently. Maybe take one guy and position him three yards outside the line of scrimmage bo- or the tackle box, which enables your lineman to to reach block somebody else. And enables your running back to get seven yards, and then they got to put them back, and then you hit them. You know, it's it's a it's a yin yang, and your quarterback has to do that. And um, I, uh, you know, I mean, he's eleven to sixteen this year passing, which is pretty much on par for what Brennan Sullivan did at Northwestern. He was at sixty eight percent now, and there he was. Um, you know, I think sixty six, sixty five percent. That's cr- that's really good. That's better than I was had. You know, since Beathard and and fifteen, now the style of offense is completely different. But you know, I think if he can hit north sixty percent, not make many mistakes, if any, run the ball. I, I think your numbers are right on, Chad. I mean, one forty and forty. You know, if he can do something like that, and you've got um, a thoroughbred at running back, I, I hope people are starting to realize how good this guy is. I was watching some highlights even today on Sean Green in 08 and against Wisconsin. And and Sean was outstanding. Best running back in the country that year. Caleb's better. I can say that honestly. You know, watching them both. I mean, Sean was a, a good NFL running back. Mm-hmm. Caleb's got Pro Bowl potential at the next wow. level. I really think so. So um and if you can get him a little bit of space, I mean, the explosives are unbelievable. How many? Yeah. 20, I mean, it's just, you know, just how he could just slither through and, and he's, he's got every asset you want. So if you can, you know, we've, we've got four more games with him here. <laughs> Let's just be real. I don't, I don't see him playing in a bowl game. Mm-hmm. I don't see him playing in an, an Iowa uniform next year, but I think um, celebrate what you got. Cause this is, this is pretty good. Yeah, well, you know who also has a stellar game plan every time, Scott? That is Game Day Men's Health. Game Day Men's Health specializes in testosterone replacement therapy, helps you feel like you're in your 20s again, like Caleb Johnson. Feel like you're Caleb Johnson with Game Day Men's Health. How about that pitch? Uh, Getting your T levels higher means you're in a better mood. You have a stronger sex drive. Your energy is great. And you're going to need that with daylight savings this weekend. You're going to need that extra energy. Uh, it's a huge help for your exercise regimen, uh, your rec sports, your competitive sports. Uh, game day men's health can also help you with your weight loss. I was in the West Des Moines office on Wednesday morning. Uh, consultations are free, easy, simple, uh, total privacy, total uh 
uh, no obligation. Uh, check them out at gamedaymenshealth.com or call one of their locations in Ankeny, West Des Moines, or North Liberty and tell them you heard about them on Legends and Listeners. And they'll even be more happy to help you because they'd love us too. Um, let's dig into this Iowa Wisconsin matchup, Scott. Uh, inter- a really interesting matchup. Uh, two teams with five and three records, three and two in the Big Ten. Uh, they're both tied for fifth place in the conference. Uh, curious before we talk about talk about the meaning of the matchup, but who has the better losses? Who has the better wins? I think Iowa definitely has the best win at Minnesota by seventeen. But uh, the losses to me are pretty similar. Iowa, you get Iowa State at home, or at Ohio State, at Michigan State. Wisconsin's losses are Bama at home, mm. at USC, and home against Penn State. Wisconsin's definitely got the better losses. I mean, the, the, against the better teams, I would say. I mean, well, Ohio State is is up there. Right. Let me refer. I think it's it. I think it's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, we think about Iowa State. Yeah. Um, and and the margin, you know, that you, you you they lost to Bama, USC, and and Penn State by a wide margin. I think it's I think it's comparable. I do. Yeah. I guess you know when you whenever you it, it, this is the the weird thing with college football, Chad. We, uh, me mentally, a lot, most of us mentally revert to blue blood status when we start to make comparisons. Like, oh man, we're going to play a, a Penn State or Ohio State or Alabama. And then you see them play, and, and then, you know, then maybe they have a struggle. You know, their, their year is not as good as you expect it. Well, next year, oh, Texas is back, baby. You know, <laughs> it's just kind of the way it always stands out to be. And just like if you're playing, if Iowa was playing Michigan this year, um, you know, just the name Michigan sounds more difficult than the actual product of Michigan. So I guess you're right. Um, this is pretty comparable. If you throw in that USC and Michigan state are fairly even right. Iowa state in the year that they're having with Bama and then Penn state um, with Ohio state, we'll see what that, it turns out to be later this week, but you know, I guess that's, that's pretty similar. Um, the, the thing that's, that kind of catches my eye is, you know, when Tyler Van Dyke went out with that mm-hmm. ACL, they're in a kind of a, uh, their passing game is kind of in a pregnant pause of, of sorts. Mm-hmm. Braden Locke has, has done some nice things, but he's at like 58% completion percentage. Last year he was at 50, um, seven touchdowns, six interceptions. Um, it's just kind of a net zero for them. And I think that's kind of, a, a problem for for uh you know the badgers but i think overall that you know this is still a formidable team this is a capable yeah. team and if you don't play well they will light you up yeah i mean uh iowa's wins are definitely better i mean i think i think washington's washington and minnesota are probably better than any team they've beaten um western michigan south dakota uh purdue Rutgers, northwestern so mm-hmm. are there are there five wins uh and the the three losses are by a combined 32, 17, mm-hmm. 15, um, whatever that is. 60. 60, right? 60 yeah, points. Like so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Iowa did kind of, I don't know. It depends how you look at that Michigan State game. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, wh- the stakes of this game, I guess. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I know – the playoffs out, obviously, for both these teams. What do you What do you think? I think this is when you strip it all down, and what is the most important thing to each team, and that's beating the other team, and that's the important part of to me of of sports. That's the essence of sports is that, and and this is why this game in particular to me is really matters. Is that not everybody's going to go to the playoff? Not everybody's going to go to the national championship, but you want to play your rivals and the trophy games that matter every year. And as we get farther and farther away from, you know, the history and and some of the bonds that we've had and and the sport for generations, like Northwestern games and Illinois games and Purdue and what have you, that this type of a game really matters because you've got a trophy at stake. You're two and two hours and 45 minutes away from one another. Um, And, you know, to see the the running W in red and, and to see the Tiger Hawk in gold. I mean, you know, they've been doing this for since the 1890s and you want to see it continue. So, you know, both teams are five and three. There's some pride at stake. 
it doesn't really matter about bowl positioning. They're both going to go to bowls. They're both going to, you know, who cares if they, one's goes to Charlotte, the other goes to Nashville or, or, or Tampa or, or wherever. It's just about beating the other team. It's about winning the game. And, and that's the essence of sports. So that's, that's what I look at it this, this year. It's not, the stakes aren't higher than they were when they would play for the West division, you know, lead or whatever. And they're not higher than they were, they were in 2010, which they were sky high. But I think it's just a matter of, yeah, we want to beat you. <laughs> then nothing else matters. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's. Uh, I mean, I, I do think it's a bit. I mean, it's a big game. You have, we I, we talked last week. Is this season um, a disappointment? And I know, you know, people have varying opinions on that. But I I think the the way I will bounce back, the way that uh, there's now a quarterback change, I think it's a huge game. For Iowa mm-hmm. football, because if you can, uh, if you can win this game and, and show that you've got a quarterback that maybe you could win with the rest of November, um, maybe next season, uh, somebody that that the team can rally around, the fan base can rally around. I mean, think how painful it was last year, Scott, to watch Deacon Hill every week and just knowing there's just not much. I mean, if you win, it's not even going to be fun to watch and. <laughs> you know, it's just like you almost hope to see the other guy. Um, mm-hmm. but you don't want your team to lose, but now you don't have to hope for the other guy. You've got the other guy. You know, it, it, w- it, it would be a disappointment to lose this game. They're only favored by three. It's going to be a tough game. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot to play for. You got you can still go nine and three. Uh, again, one of there's probably only going to be three Big Ten teams to make the playoff. Maybe four. Maybe. Um, but there's a lot of good SEC. There's a lot of SEC teams in the mix here too, and mm-hmm. I'm sure a couple of Big Twelve unbeaten's would li- ha- like to have a word. Not to mention some others in the mix, and Notre Dame's right there again. I mean, that's it's hard to make the playoff, and I don't think I don't know if ten and two would have got Iowa in anyway. So, um, that aside, nine and th- I don't think nine and three would be that bad. So this is a big step towards that. I think you could finish fifth in the Big Ten. Uh, you know. There's no po- there's no party for that, but fifth out of eighteen teams in the new Big Ten, there's there's something to be said for that. Um, I think there's a lot, and then they can still win a tenth game. So uh, I think it's more about um, trying to, like you said, beat Wisconsin. There is that is a rivalry. This would be the first time since 05, 04, 05, that Iowa has won three straight against Wisconsin. That has not happened mm-hmm. since then. Um, this has been a series that the Badgers kind of have controlled since the fake punt in 2010. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, by the way, Wisconsin ran a fake punt the other day. It was unintentional, but it, but it did kind of look similar yeah. <laughs> in some ways. Uh, just a <laughs> wide open pasture. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that would mean something, you know, to, to beat them three times in a row. It doesn't happen that often. And you would like to, I don't know, you know just – Put your thumb on the Luke Fickle thing two years in a row um, if you're Kirk Ferentz. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, Kirk's told me multiple times, and you know, I've, I've asked him specifically, what uh, is there a team or a program that you measure yourself against? And he always would say Wisconsin. Because, I mean, and at that point, they were in the West Division together. So, and Wisconsin – had it going for about a 10 year block where it was, it was a juggernaut. It was, you can make the case. And I think it's statistically it me- me- measures out that from, you know, 2010 through 2019 or whatever, that they were the second best team in the big 10 year in and year out. I mean, Ohio state was number one, but they were number two and, and uh, they had a competitive team. They had a team that went 12 and zero and, and 17 and then won its bowl game. And, 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 you know, made, you know, won the division what four times, and and then two, and the, what two, yeah, two in the old system. You know, as leaders, division champs, and and so that you know they were really a, a good program and and a good way to measure yourself against. But you know, we, me and you, we were hanging out kind of with uh, Nick Jackson and, and Jay Higgins after the game for a little bit, and um, two of my favorite players, by the way, I mean, you don't get better than them. They're salt of the earth types and there, there they are standing together, doing their interviews together and wearing their uniforms. I mean, that's like a lasting image to me of those guys. But, you know, I, I wrote this week, Chad, about kind of what's next for Iowa, you know, now that, 
you're you know you're not even to Halloween yet, and you're you don't have a chance to win, go to the playoff. You don't have a chance to win a division title that doesn't exist anymore. You're not going to win the conference, and and a lot of teams fall apart. You know, especially ones with that have a lot of veterans that come back and and they kind of you know fold. And and that's happened a couple of times in Iowa, not as many as it does other places. But you know, here's the quote that I think just it sums up not just Jay and who he is, but it's really the program because I will give Kirk a lot of credit with this, that his teams play hard. They always play hard. They don't fall apart. They, it doesn't matter what's at stake. They're out there and they're not quitting. They're not giving up. And, and here's what Jay said to, to us. And I, you know, use this kind of at the end. And that is, we've got a lot of guys who have no more eligibility after this. I'm going to play every game. Like it's my last because it literally is my last. We don't want to take these moments for granted. I, I, we don't want to take these games for granted. We've only got two games left at Kinnick. We've only got 12 or 13 of these opportunities. We don't have the luxury of assuming that there's more football after this. I'm all in on Iowa football, playing in the black and gold. And I think I got a bunch of guys on the team who are more interested in playing today, playing now, and not really looking forward. Now, if you're, if you're an Iowa fan, you're going to stand up and applaud on that because that's your guy. And he's, he's talking for you because the game still matters to you. It should. Yes, this season may have been a disappointment because you're not in the playoff, but you still got to play the games. You still want to see them win. You still want to see them, you know, go to a bowl game, maybe win 10 games, you know, and, and yes, the big picture, it's not as robust as you want, but when you got a guy saying that your guy, you got to be excited. Yeah. Great stuff. We'll miss Jay Higgins in the, in the soundbite, uh, mm-hmm. sound bites next year for sure. Uh, he's great. Uh, Nick Jackson's great too, by the yeah. way. Um, uh, Jamari Harris has been outstanding as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, just that, that whole defense. Um, got to talk to actually speaking of great, Kelvin Bell was great on Wednesday mm-hmm. as well. That we're always, always like hearing from Kelvin, uh, really tells it like it is. And, um, you know, it's, he makes you earn it on that defensive line. Um, so speaking of how do you win this game? Uh, how do you win the game, Scott? That's the, we, we like to talk matchups on legends and listeners. Um, that's where I think it starts. Scott is, uh, defensive line because if you if Iowa can stop the run on Saturday and they had trouble against a few good offensive lines uh they struggled against Michigan State struggled against Ohio State um if they can stop the run on Saturday then I really like Iowa's chances if they don't I don't like Iowa's chances Mm -hmm. so I think that's where this game is decided for me yeah that it it really is as it always is it's a line of scrimmage game between these two teams and and the the crazy part is i mean with wisconsin that they try to go you know they've switched with phil longo as their oc to to be in more of a a, an 11 personnel program and and they haven't had the quarterbacks to do it you know mordecai was so so last year and then they went got tyler van dyke and he got hurt and you know Braden locks not complete enough passes to make it worth your while and so you're kind of like what the heck is going on here they still got some good linemen though and they do have a really good running back you know and, and tolly walker i mean he's he's a good guy but but i also think that Iowa's off Iowa's defensive line is capable of neutralizing the line of scrimmage. And then with the back seven, I still think they're pretty good. You know, they've given up some big plays and they have some sore spots and, you know, and they'll get tested, you know, at some point in the season again, but, but, you know, to flip it on the other side, I like Iowa's chances of running the ball against them. This is not the same Wisconsin of the past five years, six years ago, where their run fits were so good that they could do so many things when they had, you know, they had a three man front, but they were never out of position and they were always there executing and just crushed every running game that they went against. This is not it. I mean, you know, they're 67th, uh, you know, in rush defense nationally. That's not a great number against a team that has a veteran offensive line. Like we know with Iowa, and they're not entirely comfortable in a four-man front. I mean, they, they do go to it, but it's just not the same. So I think Iowa, if if um, Brennan Sullivan can make the makeables in the passing game, he'll have to make some. But otherwise, I think Iowa can really control this game from the line of scrimmage against, you know, still a pretty formidable Wisconsin team, though. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the line's only three points, so it's expected to be close. Uh, even with a night game at Kinnick, you know, you're only favored by three, and that's that's usually pretty valuable. Uh, so it tells you it's a toss-up probably. Um, but, yeah, like uh, 
yeah, Caleb Johnson has had 14 carries in each of the last two games. I think he's ready to go. He's mm-hmm. fresh. He's, you know, uh, you know, pound him. This could, I mean, this could be one of those. Uh, this could be a Sean Green 2008 type of game against Wisconsin if if all goes well. Because um, yeah, this offensive line, um, you know, should be. Uh, should have the advantage, I feel like. Um, mm-hmm. And if you t- if you take out sacks, like Wisconsin's given up, like close to six yards a carry, the five and a half yards a carry this year. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that's that's where the advantage is, I think, for Iowa. But still, got to stop that run. Uh, and I I like having Castro back um, mm-hmm. going in. with them at eleven. Mm-hmm. I want Castro. I mean, Iowa should be at its best defensively. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how often they go twelve. Um, I doubt they do much. Very right? rarely. Yeah. So you're, I think you're just going to see a lot of four two five on Saturday, which is, frankly, that's Iowa's best defense. Mm-hmm. It's four two five with Castro. <laughs> as long as Castro's there. <laughs> yeah. As long as Castro. I think we saw. I think we realized how good he. I thought. You know. I said like a month ago. Like hey, I don't think Castro's playing that well. Uh, I take that back. Uh, I think. <laughs> I think I realize how valuable he is, and he was great against Wisconsin last year, Scott. They've got some, you know, it, it is worth appreciating some of the players that they do have. And I mean, they do have, you know, they've had a sore spot, as we've mentioned before, it, it, um, you know, which everybody's seen a right corner. And then, you know, overall pass rush at times isn't quite there, but YA Black is tremendous up front. He's played at a all, all you know, an all American level. He's just not going to have the stats to, to, get him there jamari harris has played at that level too he's gonna he's moving right up i saw in the, one of the latest draft projections you know he's he's in the top 150 which he wasn't even on the board you know before the season so wow you know that's putting him in the what fifth. you know fourth slash fifth round and yeah. and um you know once he goes through workouts and people really start to analyze what he did and how he's played he's probably going to be a third rounder i mean you know i remember you know michael ojamudia and you know being a third rounder and he had unreal speed but i, I think jamari was a better player than the ojamudia was and and uh you know but some and castro and, and higgins are the glue pieces and, and nick jackson too but especially castro and higgins it's just you can't remove them from that from this team and replace them with somebody adequate at this point in their careers. Well, it's, uh, I do, I don't know, maybe I'm prisoner of the moment here, but I do feel like they found themselves a little bit in that Northwestern game, like just kind of, I think Lee's stabilized him a little bit at corner. Uh, not, not great, but uh, he's not terrible. Um, mm-hmm. He's probably the one that gets burned the least. <laughs> so, um, Sad. And then, you know, and honestly, Hey, uh, Quinn Schulte had had his best game of the season uh, the other day, and Wampa Xavier Wampa's playing a lot better. So I, I think I feel like I don't think they need to rotate safeties anymore. Like with entering, I think Wampa's playing just fine. So mm-hmm. I would just go eleven, go with your or go your four two five, uh, play with those eleven guys, and well, rotate the D line, but back seven. Um, ro- no, no need to rotate. Um, mm-hmm. Anything else in the game? You want to move to Big Ten? You know, let's let's move to Big Ten, but I know I need to have a, a, a nice drink before I do that. You know? <laughs> well, there, it is a high anxiety week uh, with the election on Tuesday. Uh, you know, it could be a long night, uh, maybe even a long week. Uh, there's no better companion needs to wait for those election returns than Steeple Ridge Bourbon from farm to bottle. Steeple Ridge brings a high quality, delicious drinking, award winning craft bourbon. If you don't find Steeple Ridge Bourbon at your grocery store uh, or at your tailgate uh, at Kinnick this weekend, ask for it by name. Uh, Steeple Ridge is distilled, aged, and bottled in Iowa at Lonely Oak Distillery. Uh, thank you, Steeple Ridge, for being a part of Legends and Listeners uh, pretty much from the get-go. We really appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, obviously the big one this week in the Big Ten, Scott, is uh, Ohio State-Penn State. That's the uh, big noon game on Fox. A lot of you're Mr. TV, so give us a. Uh, a lot of people are upset that the whiteout game isn't at night. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously, Fox had the pick, right? What you know? Mm-hmm. How does this happen? 
Well, they're, they've transitioned it to next week against Washington to the whiteout. Oh, they moved the whiteout. Okay. Yeah. They're, that's their one. They might have another one. They, they have them when they want to. It's, <laughs> it's like they dedicate one and it's like, we need to have whiteout energy against Illinois or whatever they do. Um, I'm sure they got something to complain about here pretty quick, but um, it's Penn state after all, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, this, this is a, Obviously, it's massive, um, you know, for the national landscape as much as it is the the um, Big Ten. Uh, Ohio State's a three point favorite, but they both have kind of they have injury issues. I mean, you know, Ohio State's down to their third left tackle. That's not good at all, and they didn't run the ball at all. Worth of crap against Nebraska last week, um, which is really surprising after what we saw. Um, I think Nebraska had a really good game plan for them. I thought the officiating was, was as bad as I've seen in any game. I mean, the missed spot on that. Yeah, that was game. terrible. That was justified to be mad about that if you're a Nebraska fan. That yeah, was really That bad. was like a, a yard and a half off. I mean. Yeah, to change the going, game. Yeah. I mean, and then um, Penn State, you know, Drew Allard's game time decision, you know, Bo Perbilla is, Perbilla is, is pretty good. I mean, he was like 12 or 13 against uh, Wisconsin and you know, after he came in, but, um, you know, the, the thing is, it's interesting is, I mean, Penn state has lost seven straight in this series and they measure themselves against Ohio state and they haven't measured up. I mean, they find a way to lose every single time. And, uh, last year, you know, they, they had nothing on offense two years ago. It was all turnovers. I think they were minus four and, um, you know, and, and it's not as, imperative to win this game as was in the past as far as you know they couldn't get to the big Ten championship now they can get to the playoff without winning it but you know i think they also want to win the big 10 championship and if you win this game you knock ohio state out of that part of it you know there'll be a two loss team in the big 10 now they can still get in the playoff but and and you can put yourself in a really good position you know maybe win the big 10 championship maybe get a bye or you know worst case scenario have a home game in the playoff so um you know it's a huge game with a lot of stakes and i think all eyes in the country are going to be on on that one and you know and then they can worry about white out next week against washington <laughs> Okay, yeah. Sorry about the whiteout mix up. Glad you straightened Oh, I'm me sure out there. they're. I'm sure they've got whiteout this week. It's if it's not a whiteout, it's whiteout energy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, after that, Penn State has home against Washington at Purdue at Minnesota, mm. home, home against Maryland. So yeah, if they win this, they're in the playoff for sure. I mean, yeah, not, I mean Minnesota is the one that can kind of bite them. Yeah. But you know, they're playing better. I mean, they are, but, but Penn state's, you know, you just wonder going up to go for land and, you know, in the middle of November, we've been there when it was minus one and, yeah. you know, <laughs> that you never know, <laughs> you know, things, weird things can happen. And they lost the last, they haven't won there since 2010. So that is kind of a, a wasteland for them in some ways, but, wow. um, you know, to me, a fascinating game, Chad, this week, and this is really under the radar minnesota at illinois yeah i mean minnesota is back up to five and three illinois six and two yeah um, you know this is they're pretty good teams yeah and illinois is a three-point home underdog uh -huh. that that line is very strange to me i mean i i i think illinois is going to beat them but uh, that line tells me maybe i shouldn't be so confident <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. yeah, I mean Minnesota is playing a lot better, um, and that's you know, and, and that's why I say that Iowa win at Minnesota looks really good right now. Yeah, I mean they they blew out Maryland at yeah. big time. Um, mm -hmm. They've won three in a row. They beat USC and UCLA. I mean their their losses. Um, you know they, they only played really one bad half of football. You know they got dominated by Iowa for a second half, and then the rest of them. I mean, North Carolina they should have won. I was there, and I mean they missed the field goal. You know, the, the all Big Ten kicker misses a field goal to win it. You know, that sort of thing. And um, onside so, kick at Michigan was yeah right. You know, they got kind of got hosed there. They might not have won, but they got hosed. Oh, man, official, officials helping out Michigan and Ohio State. That's amazing. <laughs> huh? Never expected that, huh? Yeah. By the way, I do. I'm going to pick Ohio State in that other game. By the way, I just I think yeah. they're just they're going to put their hand, foot down at some point. I mean, they've got they have to be pissed after this yeah. Nebraska showing, and I think there was a look ahead factor there. I do. I think yeah. they're I think they're ready to lay down the hammer, no matter if they get down to their fifth left tack left tackle. 
But anyway. you, know, you just can't have that kind of talent and, and lose. I mean, if, if they go, if they lose and that's their second loss, they're still in the playoff because they're Ohio state, but they got to beat Indiana. Yeah. You got to beat Indiana. And you, and I wouldn't, I, mean, I wouldn't just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they have a tough schedule. No yeah. question. And, and, uh, what do you think about some of the others there? I mean, Indiana at Michigan State. Yeah, on Peacock. They yeah. put that on. Pe- <laughs> they must have signed that one a long time ago. Uh, no, they decided a- it Saturday because Michigan State said no more night games. Oh, really? They've had like four night games in a row, and they just said, we can't do this anymore. Logistically, it's killing us. Because I wouldn't have been surprised if that one would have been the night game because Indiana's undefeated, and, yeah. and Michigan State's been playing better. I mean, they beat Iowa two weeks ago, but but you know they were just like, we're, okay. we're done with that. We can't do this. So they, uh, they moved that to, to – the day oh, okay all right see that's why you're mr you're a tv <laughs> guy you know all this stuff uh but yeah what a game i, I sounds like uh curtis rourke's gonna be back mm-hmm. sounds like he's gonna play now so yeah i mean i thought <laughs> i mean our glimpse of michigan state was like they're world beaters mm-hmm. um, they look so good against iowa but um, I've been talking to like some Michigan State fans, like, yeah, that was like the only time <laughs> that they've looked good this year. So uh, they're not as confident. Um, yeah, it's hard to. I keep thinking Indiana's going to slip up, but uh, uh, you covered them in person. That like they're they're for real, right? Yeah, they're for real. I mean, that's that said, if Michigan State plays the way it did against Iowa, it will be a competitive game. Yeah, it has to be because that was they, they played so well against Iowa. Aiden Childs, man. I mean, he was he was a guy. You know, I, I think I was saying, you know, great talent, mistake prone, and he didn't make any mistakes. So there you go. But I think with with Indiana, their offense is as good as I've seen it in a long time. And it's not so much. I mean, they've got good players, no question. You know, they they've got you know, or you know, Rourke is he's like a guy that'll go to the next level, and you know, like Rich Gannon or something, and just you know, kind of underrated and all of a sudden he starts up oh, Brock Purdy, you know, just, you know, and not just because he looks like Brock, but just that, that type of quarterback that'll be, people aren't thinking about. And then all of a sudden, wow, he's really good. Um, they got two really good receivers as well, but it's the, the scheme, the, the design and the ability to hit those guys um, and trust your receivers. It's just, I was, I was blown away. I mean, I'll be honest. It was really impressive to watch and, and their defense is really good too. So, I mean, but I can also see this at Michigan state If Michigan state plays its best game. It could be a, in the fourth quarter. And then you start to wonder about Indiana because they haven't trailed in any quarter at all this year. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, Indiana, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, and then uh, Oregon at Michigan on CBS, also at 2.30. That's like kind of an afterthought this week. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, what, could Oregon stumble? I think they're 15-point favorite. Yeah. I don't know. I, mean, Mich- I still don't know what to make of Michigan. I mean, they just yeah. don't have a, they're basically like Iowa last year. They just don't have a quarterback. Right. Um, except they're Michigan. <laughs> they do have some more athletes on the offensive side of the ball than Iowa did. But yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no offense to yeah. uh, uh, the the 2023 Hawkeyes on offense, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got, they got some Ad- Addison Estranga was their their top weapon. Addison Estranga <laughs> and Nico Regaini. Yeah. Uh, the UCLA at Nebraska at two thirty on BTN. Uh, that's a good one if you're a Hawk fan, just to check out your, mm-hmm. your two of your final three opponents. Uh, obviously, we haven't talked about it much, but UCLA is a short week coming up here, so mm-hmm. uh, coming off a night game for the Hawks, and they're kind of improving. Yeah, Nebraska. No. Nebraska obviously played well against Ohio State. How do they respond to that? Are they like high because they because they played Ohio State well, or are they kind of like I don't know? Like they spent, or they spent because of how they played against Ohio State and got drilled in Indiana. How do you, what do you think Nebraska does this week? This to me is the ultimate Matt Rule game mm. because how do you, where do you steer your team, your program from this point on? I mean, you got annihilated in Indiana, 56 to seven. And if it would have been two more quarters, it would have been 85 to seven. I mean, it was that bad. But the way they played at Ohio State was a winning effort. I mean, they were right there. And can you build on that? Okay, no moral victories, but take the next step. Go win games, you know, or do you 
you know, oh, woe is us, and you know, like they have in the past. And I think, you know, if they go out and win, I mean, that puts them in a bowl game for the first time since 2016, and it does it at home. That's probably a good, you know, factor for them. And you know, but yeah, as you said, UCLA is improving. They they played better. They went to they won at Rutgers, and and they've played some games close lately. And um, but you know, and then there's uh, USC and in Washington, which is at night. And I thought that originally was going to end up being the, the NBC game, but yeah, I was um, surprised. Yeah. I, like, well, I, I wonder why they didn't want that. What do you think? BTN claimed it, but I don't know if, if it just claimed it early or what, but it, it's kind of a weird little thing, but, but even so, but neither one of those, I mean, I guess USC did beat Wisconsin, but I'd say Wisconsin's a better team today. And, and, uh, so, uh, you know, to me, looking at their schedules, whoever loses that game is going to struggle to get to a bowl game. Mm-hmm. I think they're, the winner's like six and six, USC and Washington. Imagine that. But that's kind of where they're at. And, and then, uh, you know, Northwestern and Purdue. <laughs> we skipped that one out for <laughs> a reason. Not. Yeah. <laughs> Northwestern's a one point favorite. Ugh. On the road. That's uh, how bad it, Purdue is. Purdue. I know. But, and watching Purdue, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I, you know, and the, the scary thing is, Chad, we saw Northwestern last week and they look bad. Mm. You know, I saw Purdue the week before and they look worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what to think. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, a fun time. Uh, first playoff rankings come out Tuesday, right? On election mm-hmm. night. That's going to be the big, that's going to be the big news Tuesday. Um, <laughs> the rankings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, will the Hawks be ranked if they beat Wisconsin? What do you think? I doubt it, really? but okay. yeah, six and three, six, yeah, and three. six and three. They got a shot, I suppose. I mean, if they win dominant fashion, maybe, but I, I, I but if they beat UCLA, they maybe got a better shot to be ranked and, yeah, okay. you know, and, and it'd be nice if let's say by the end of the year, both Nebraska and I were in the top 25, you know, one's like mm-hmm. 21 and one's like 23 in whatever mm-hmm. order. And so at least has some you know, oomph to it, you know, that would, yeah, that'd be cool. All right, so what's the toughest game remaining on Iowa's schedule? Is it is it Wisconsin this week or is it Nebraska? I'm gonna go Nebraska. Okay, because I, I think Nebraska has a more potential than mm-hmm. Wisconsin does this year. That, I mean, that doesn't mean they can, they're gonna win, but it just means when I look at that team, you know, I, they have a better quarterback. They have better defense and Mm -hmm. they have some pretty good skill position players. So I, I I think Nebraska's ceiling is a little higher than Wisconsin's, but you know, um, Wisconsin's a little more proven and we know what kind of game this is going to be. It's going to be physical and which is why I love it. I'm so glad it's still part of our big 10 landscape, no matter how it changes. That's right. It's a protected, uh, protected rival. Thank you, Gary Barta. (laughs) <laughs> he messed up the first time so he had to do it the second time <laughs> all right for scott Docterman, this is chad lysico legends and listeners we'll be back with you thursday morning uh one day ahead of the iowa ucla game so we'll talk to you next week from the channel seat studios only on iowa everywhere